This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so welcome to Ditch the Dish, Streaming Media 101. This is a repeat of the program I did in February. So if you attended that, um, or if you intended it in the just sitting out in the library because you couldn't fit in the meeting room, this is the pretty much same content, but um, I think it's still going to be uh, an interesting presentation. I, I learned a lot while preparing for this presentation. I already have been streaming media for a while, but there's just a lot to know about this topic. So, um, you know, I, I hope that everybody will enjoy it. Again, feel free to stop me and ask questions. I will take a break periodically I and uh, take a peek at the take a peek at the chat box to see if questions are coming in that way as well. This is my. Uh, Contact information, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. We're not at the library right now to answer that phone number, but you can leave a message. Um, and I do check that machine a couple times a week. But the best way to get in touch with me right now is by email. So feel free to do that whenever you, you do need some help. I'm answering two or three tech questions a day <clears throat> lately, so um, I'm still available for that service or for any other questions you might have about library services while we're closed. So, um, oh, the streaming crap. media industry is pretty, it's gotten pretty important. <laughs> um, oh, so it's $15.9 billion is how much people spent on streaming media in the United States last year. So it, it really is big business. Lots of people are getting into this. Um, and uh, it's something that you can do too. We'll talk about what you're going to need. So this, don't start taking notes yet. These are the kinds of things we're going to talk about today. And these are the questions I want you to have in the back of your mind while you're thinking about setting yourself up for streaming. So your budget's gonna be a consideration, your internet speed, how you want to watch, and then what kind of content you wanna watch. We're gonna revisit this slide later, so don't don't bother um, you know, trying to take notes on all of this. Um, in the in-person class, this went for about 90 minutes. I'm hoping to keep it closer to an hour today. So it just, um, it just depends on um, how many questions come in and so on. Um, and I've had a question, can I can I mute people? I don't, I think I might be able to mute people. I can't mute the people that are on telephones, I don't think. Um, but I can mute the people who are in on their computer. And so I'm doing that. If, you, if I've muted you, um, do try to um, unmute yourself if you have a question, but keep yourselves muted otherwise. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about is I do have a door prize. We were going to do this program again at the library last month, and I had a door prize lined up for that, so I'm going to give it away anyway. We're going to do it um, online this time. So throughout this presentation, I'll have three trivia questions. I will give you the answers. You don't have to learn the answers on your own. Um, so all you're going to have to do to enter is send me an email with the three correct answers before Sunday night. So for people who aren't able to listen live right now, I'm going to put this recording on our website, and then you can um, those people can watch it and still participate in that drawing. Only if you live in the Northern Waters Library Service area, though. So I'm only going to mail it to the counties that you see listed here. That's the um, the area that our library service handles, and that's the um, the group of libraries that we cooperate with to provide programming and services to all of our patrons. So, what is streaming? <clears throat> streaming media is multimedia that is constantly sent and received by a user. Um, so, the, the old style of getting media online was to um, download an entire file and then start watching it or reading it or listening to it. And that's how, for example, our digital library works. If you have an audiobook that you've borrowed, you go through your app and you download the whole file and then you can press play and start listening to it. Streaming is where that, that file is sent to you almost in the same amount of time that you're watching it or listening to it. So um, it doesn't take as long in advance to, to load into your machine. It just, you kind of press play and it starts playing a moment later. Um, so just a terminology thing, the term live streaming is usually means something that is happening live, a sporting event or a live recorded, not a, not a recorded video, but something that is being presented in real time or as close to real time as the internet will allow. So that's the difference between streaming and live streaming. Um, later on, we'll talk about streaming live TV. So that's kind of like live streaming, but, but really live streaming is about live events, typically sports and sometimes music. You'll see some live streaming going on right now on Facebook and other places where musicians are sitting in their living rooms. They're doing live streams of themselves playing and talking with their 
fans. So, um, so just a little terminology. We do have a lot to cover today, so I cannot um, start right at ground zero. I have to make a few assumptions about your skill level. Um, the fact that you're all here listening online tells me you do already have some skills, which is great. Um, I'm going to assume for the sake of this presentation that you have some kind of internet service at home. You have an email account and uh, you know how to do some basic internet navigation, including how to like enter a credit card number and know when it's safe to do that online because you're going to have to be able to um, provide credit cards to some of these companies that are providing streaming services. So if, if, none of these, if some of these assumptions don't apply to you and you have questions about any of these things, you can always reach out to me by phone or by email and we can talk about them. Or when the library's open again, you can come on down to Tech Tuesday and we'll, we'll talk about them then. So let's get into the program here. So what do you need to stream media to your house? You basically are gonna need an internet connection. You're gonna need a television or some other kind of um, screen to watch on. You're gonna need a streaming device and that might be built into that screen or it might be a separate thing. And then you're gonna need a streaming service to provide the content. Um, and so we're gonna talk about all those things. And first up, we're gonna talk about your internet service. This is the biggest stumbling block for people in the Northwoods, unfortunately, because you guys know that we don't have great internet coverage uh, in the Northwoods. And so, that's going to be one of the things that um, is going to determine whether or not you can even do this. So considering your internet speed, first of all. So let's, let's assume that you can get internet of some kind at your house. Um, <clears throat> the, the column on the left here, where I've, I've said speed and then I've got some ratings listed there, these are the recommended internet speeds to do these different kinds of services. So if you're just streaming audio, if you're streaming music or a podcast, 128 kilobits per second. Anybody who's on anything that's faster than dial-up is gonna be able to do that. Standard definition video, three megabits per second. We do have some households in, in the Northwoods that can't get internet service even at three megabits. They're down at 1.5 or two. Um, so that, that if, you're, if you're in that low range from your internet service provider, um, you're gonna be just able maybe to stream some standard definition video. If you wanna do high def video, if you have a better television or a bigger screen, you're gonna need five to eight megabits per second um, of internet speed. And um, if you wanna do 4K, really high speed video, you're gonna be bumping up to that 25 megabits per second range. And if you have multiple people in your house, maybe your teenager wants to watch her show in the bedroom and you wanna watch yours in the living room, um, then you're really gonna need some high speed data to be able to do that. Now, these are the ratings that the companies who are providing streaming service will tell you you need. I can tell you that you're gonna get away with less than this. I, for example, have about 25 megabit service at my house and I am able to do um, multiple streams. We, it's pretty regular that you know my husband's watching one thing, my daughter's listening to music and I'm doing another thing. And we don't often run into too many problems. Right now is not the best time to test this because the internet is pretty overwhelmed with everyone staying at home and working from home. Um, so I've noticed some significant slowdowns in my internet speed at home. And uh, so this, you know, this may or may not apply right at this immediate moment in time in the Northwoods or anywhere else in the world right now. Um, but in general, the better internet speed you can buy from your internet service provider, the more, e the more easily you're gonna be able to stream media to your house. So how do you know how much speed you have? You can go to a website called speedtest.net and uh, it will automatically test the actual connection of your computer at that moment in time. Um, that's gonna fluctuate throughout the day depending on what's happening at your ISP, depending on what's happening in the internet as a whole, um, but it'll give you at least a picture of what you have now. You also should be able to tell by what you're purchasing from your internet service provider. So you're, you're buying a package that's based on a certain number of megabits per second. And so you can look at the package that you've got, it's with your phone bill or your cable bill or whoever you're getting your internet from, and that's gonna tell you what your speed should be. It's pretty rare for you to get exactly what you're being, what, what you know the number that your provider is telling you. You're usually gonna get something a little smaller than that. If you're getting something a lot smaller than what you're paying for, then you should contact your service provider. Any questions about internet speed? OK, 
Okay, if you have any, feel free to speak up when you do. Um, so talking about the amount of data you need, uh, most people on their home internet connections do not have data limits. Some people do. Um, there are a couple of services like HughesNet that will slow down your plan or will throttle the amount of data that you're allowed to use. If you're trying to use streaming services on a mobile device, that's when you really need to pay attention to how much data you use. So for example, Netflix uses about a gigabyte per hour if you're playing standard definition video. So if you have a cell phone plan that only gives you two gigabytes of data a month, you really don't wanna be using that to stream Netflix because you're gonna use it up in two hours time. Um, you can see that some of the other services, YouTube for example, has you know, lower quality video, so it's gonna use a little bit less data. Um, but a lot of them are gonna be in the multiple gigabits per hour, gigabytes per hour range. So if you have a limited data plan for however you're accessing the internet, that's gonna be a real concern for you. If you have unlimited data, if you're on DSL at home or cable, most of those plans do not have data caps, so you don't have to worry about that. And then the last thing to think about is your connection. How are you connecting your streaming device to the internet? If you can physically plug in with an ethernet cable to your DSL modem or to how, whatever is bringing the internet into your house, that's gonna be the fastest and most reliable um, connection. And that connection between your modem or router and the streaming device is important. So if you can do that ethernet connection, then do it. Not every device allows that. And of course, not every house setup allows that either. So um, if you're gonna go wireless, the more the newer wireless formats are faster than the old ones. So um, 802.11 AX is the latest standard. Um, most houses don't have that yet. Um, AC is the one that a lot of places have. If you have an older router, um, if you're if it's using 802.11 N, A, B, or G, you're going to kind of get mixed results on the amount of speed that your router can transmit wirelessly to your streaming device. So um, basically the age of your router matters is what I'm saying. If you're still using the same DSL modem and router that you got from CenturyLink, you know, six, seven, eight years ago, and you're having trouble streaming, you might wanna think about whether it's time to upgrade that device, that, that internet router and, and modem. Any questions about that? Okay, so if your internet is slow and you think it shouldn't be, you think you've got um, decent speed from your ISP or whatever, there's a few things you could look at to make it better. So um, interference in your house might be a problem. Is your router behind a cinder block wall, for example? Is there like a big heavy wall between your streaming device and TV and where your router is? Um, is it close to a microwave oven or a cordless phone? Those kinds of things. Um, right now, the biggest thing you're gonna see is just general slowdowns from your internet service provider. And that's because um, everybody, all those providers are getting overwhelmed. There's so many people logging in right now trying to do work or stream video from home that um, now is not a great time to judge the, the quality of service you're getting. Um, the other thing that can happen is if you're trying to watch something live and it's a really popular event, um, sometimes those events, you know, they have to stream out the data from their location and sometimes they can get overwhelmed. So sometimes popular events, um, for example, the Super Bowl, um, or you know, really big type, worldwide type events, those you may have some trouble and that might not be on your end at all, it might be on their end. Um, and I mentioned older equipment, uh, less powerful devices, they may, might not always stream well. If your router is really old, you might have to think about upgrading it. Okay, so here's our first trivia question. Um, so get a pencil and jot this answer down because this is one of the three questions you need to answer, tell me in an email in order to be entered to win our door prize. So after the British burned the Library of Congress during the War of 1812, who sold their personal collection to the library to help rebuild it? And the answer is Thomas Jefferson. He sold um, 6,487 volumes for a little bit less than $4 per book. So that was how we rebuilt the, or the beginnings of how we rebuilt the Library of Congress in 1812. Okay, so write down Thomas Jefferson and send that in your email to me. Okay, so let's move on to talking about what kind of screen you wanna watch your media on. I'm, I'm focusing really on video media. Um, you know, you can stream music too, but most people's questions that come into me are about how do I watch TV, how do I watch movies and things like that. So um, first thing I wanna talk about are smart TVs. 
And a smart TV is just the television that has an internet connection built into it. Um, most of them have some kind of operating system where they can install and run some apps to do different services. So you might get a smart TV that can run Netflix or Hulu or the Roku channel or some of those other things. Um, do you need a smart TV? No. As a matter of fact, I don't personally recommend them. Um, and there's several reasons for that. First is that um, t television makers are not computer makers, although you know there's a lot of overlap, obviously. Um, and smart television operating systems tend to be clunky. They tend to not get updated very often. And there have been some um, really glaring security and privacy concerns with smart television operating systems. Things from you know, minor stuff like you know, people, someone could follow what you're watching to major stuff like if your smart TV has a camera built in, some of them have security flaws that would allow someone to turn on that camera and observe you in your living room. So I'm not trying to scare you, but I am saying that um, smart TVs as, as a whole don't get updated as frequently as your computer or your other devices. Um, and they can have some real concerns. Also, unless you're really shopping at the high end of smart TV devices, I personally find their um, navigation and, and operating systems to be clunky and kind of hard to use. So um, up to Consumer Reports reported in November of 2019 that about 60% of smart TV owners basically just turn off the smart features of their TV and plug in another streaming device anyway. So if you have a smart TV, and you might because it's getting harder and harder to purchase one that doesn't have those smart features, one thing that I might recommend you do is just not connect that television to the internet directly. Just don't tell the television the Wi-Fi password. Plug in a, another device, a streaming device, and we'll talk about those in a little while, and use that to stream your media and tell that device your internet password. That's the, that's the best way to avoid those security concerns with smart TVs. So when you go out and buy a new television, it is getting harder to buy one that doesn't have those smart features but you don't have to use them just because they're there. You can use them though. Not all of them have major problems. So there's just awful lot of those smart TVs out there and I can't really review all of them. So I can't give you a lot of specific advice on which one is safe and which one isn't. So you do need to have certain specifications available from your television. Um, you have to have an HDMI port. So you're not gonna be able to do this on an older tube, tube style TV that has um, you know, an S video cable or something like that. You're, you're really gonna need HDMI because streaming uses digital video. Um, and then a USB port is helpful on the back of your TV because it can provide power. HDMI only carries video and sound. It doesn't carry power. So if you have a stick de type device, and I'll explain what that means later, you usually have to have a way to plug that in. And having a USB port on the back of your TV will also give you a place right there to plug into. So, but the USB is not needed. You just need the HDMI. Just a quick rundown of some other television terminology if you're shopping. Um, 4K Ultra HD is like the newest, um, well, it's actually not the newest, but it's like a high resolution standard. So it's about four times more resolution than um, what we would have thought of as high def television. So high definition is 720p or 1080i or 1080p. Those are the number of pixels in the screen. Um, standard definition is lower than that, 576, 480. Ultra, 4K Ultra HD is like 3840 by 2160. So it's a lot more pixels, which gives you a lot more detailed picture and a better picture. But as we saw earlier, your internet speed may not allow you to stream that much data. So you might be showing a regular high depth picture on your 4K television anyway when you're streaming. And that's okay, that works. Um, HDR is high dynamic range. So that's just sort of like a, um, a picture improvement to the system. Dolby Vision is a dynamic HDR format. And Dolby Atmos is um, a high quality sound format. And both of those things require devices that actually have those, that actually support those, um, those standards. The reason I'm explaining these to you, or at least introducing you to them, is you're gonna see when you're buying a streaming device, they're going to list whether or not they support these kinds of features. And so you may not be able to use these, all these features if you have a slow internet connection, but if you have a Blu-ray player, for example, 
you may still want to be purchasing a television that has these features so that you can get the best picture and sound out of your out of your Blu-rays too. So, um, and just as a side note too, these slides are going to be available on our website. They're actually already there um, without the trivia questions. So you don't have to take a ton of notes during this. If you want to just see the slides later, I'll point you to where those are. So um, you don't have to stream media to a television. You can also stream it right to a tablet or a smartphone. So if you have an iPod, iPad or a um, Galaxy Tab or an iPhone or a Samsung phone or any of those smart devices, you can stream right to those things. Um, again, just if you're on a mobile internet connection, you'll want to use more you'll want to pay attention to how much internet you're using, um, how much data you're using, but you can stream right to those devices. So you don't have to buy a new TV. You can just sit in your comfy chair and hold your device in your lap. You can also stream right to a computer or a, or a Chromebook. So you can just literally go to the website of some of these streaming services and watch right within your web, web browser window, in which case you don't have to buy anything new if you already have a computer. So that's the end of my little quick overview of the different types of screens that you can use to watch um, watch something on. Do I have any questions about that? Okay, so not hearing any questions, let's go on to streaming media players. So a lot of times, um, if you don't want to use the smart features in your television, and if you're not streaming to a device like a tablet or a smartphone, you're going to need to have something that's going to deliver this picture to your TV. And this is where streaming media players come in. We're going to go over um, some of the more popular ones. There are lots of them out there, but Amazon, Roku, and Apple TV are kind of the big three right now in terms of um, numbers of sales and availability, that sort of thing. So all these things have three basic features. They have a way to connect to the internet. So some of them are only wireless. Some of them are wireless or have an ethernet port in them. Um, they all have to have power in some way. So you're gonna need to plug them in someplace. And they all have HDMI signals out so they can um, send that video and sound signal to your TV. Um, there's a wide range of prices on these things. And as with anything else, um, the, you get what you pay for. So the lower end, the less expensive devices are going to give you um, not as great quality video and sound. But for streaming, most of them are still pretty darn good. I mean, I've streamed with the $30 type devices, which is like what we're giving away today, this Roku streaming stick. And they actually work pretty well if you're not a, you know, a high end video aficionado. If you're just wanting to watch a movie or watch a TV show, I think it's going to be um, just fine for most of us. So um, let's talk about some of the specific ones. The prices that I've listed here, I looked these all up in February when I gave this presentation the first time. I didn't really have time this week to check them all, but it's going to get you in the neighborhood of what they cost. So Amazon um, is one of the big players in this. They have their Fire TV um, models. And uh, the Fire TV stick is the least expensive. And it just has regular high definition television, high definition uh, video capabilities. The Fire TV Stick 4K can display higher quality video, that 4K ultra high definition video. Uh, also has some better sound um, support. And the Fire TV Cube is kind of the top of the line Amazon device. It can connect with an ethernet cable. So if you can, you can if your house is set up as such, you can plug it right into your router and eliminate any um, lag time because of the wireless signal. It also has voice control, so you can sit in your living room chair and say, um, you know, Alexa, play The Good Place, and it'll automatically run something for you. And it has um, some storage, so you can download some things or you can um, record some live television and store it right on board. And of course, again, those high-end video and sound formats. Um, the thing about Amazon is that it really does push its own service. So Amazon's um, video library is pretty extensive. There's a lot in there. But on any of these devices, you can not, I shouldn't say any, but on most of these devices, you can install apps for other services. So just because you've purchased an Amazon device doesn't mean you can't watch Netflix or you can't watch Hulu. You'll just have to install an app for, for some of those things. 
and then you'll still be able to watch them right on this same Amazon streaming device. So the streaming device is basically what allows your, your uh, what, what connects itself to the internet to get that signal that will then be displayed on your TV. And most of these companies have made it possible for you to use other competing services on their devices. So you don't have to decide, I'm only going to watch Amazon if you buy an Amazon Fire TV device. Another big player, and I think increasingly big player in this market, is Roku. They, again, have a pretty wide range of um, price points for their devices. The Roku Express is um, one of the least expensive on the market. It's only 25 bucks and uh, it works pretty well. It's, it's kind of a stick shaped thing that you plug in right to your HDMI port on the back of your television. <clears throat> Same thing with the Roku Premiere and streaming stick. They're all stick shaped devices. They're pretty small, like, you know, less than a, about the size of a cigarette lighter or something like that, you know? And you plug them right into the back of your TV and you don't even see them then they're hiding back there. Um, and again, the price point is going to determine the features that you have available, better quality video and sound with the higher end devices. Um, Roku streaming sticks um, have a voice powered, a voice activated remote control. So you can, instead of having to type in a search, you can say your search, which is convenient. The Roku Ultra is um, the one that I have pictured here. And it actually is not a stick device well the one it's the one sitting down on the bottom it's not a stick device it doesn't plug directly into your television you set it on the table and then you run a cable an hdmi cable from it to your tv and um it has a really kind of a fun feature which i you know i think we, this is something people have been talking about like how come i can't just make my remote beep when it's lost in the couch cushions well the roku ultra has that you can there's a like a lost feature for the remote where you can have it make a sound and you can track it down so no matter where it's gotten lost in your living room, you can find it. Um, the other thing about Roku is that, or actually all these devices, is that they are like little computers. So the higher end devices don't just support better video and sound formats. They also have better processors built into them. And so your browsing experience is going to be a little smoother and a little nicer. So the Roku Ultra has a very nice um, menu and, it, and it's actually very pleasant to use. Some of the lower end devices are a little more jerky or it takes a little longer for them to process your request, that kind of thing. Not a huge difference, but it's just a little smoother. I think if you tried them both side to side, you would notice that the higher end devices with the better processors um, do kind of work a little bit better. So Apple TV is another player in this market. Apple TVs are not for the faint of wallet, usually. Um, they are some of the more expensive devices in this scenario. Um, but if you're already sort of steeped in that Apple ecosystem, if you have a Mac computer or if you have an iPhone, they do integrate pretty well. Um, <clears throat> the Apple TVs are also, they have much nicer processors in them as well. So the browsing experience and the menu experience is very nice. It's very intuitive. Um, it, it just kind of makes sense. There's not a lot of clunkiness and not a lot of button clicking. Um, it does seem to be a good experience. So um, the remote controls on Apple TVs are rechargeable, so you don't have to put batteries in them. You can plug them in, and they don't need recharging very often. And again, the higher priced devices give you that better quality video. So you see the Apple TV 4K is more expensive than the regular high definition video. And um, there's a certain amount of storage space available in them as well. Um, storage space isn't something I personally look for in a streaming device because I um, don't really save a lot of video. I just watch it when I wanna watch it. But um, for some people that might be useful, particularly if you are doing some kind of live services. Chromecasts are a little different. Um, they're very inexpensive, or at least relatively inexpensive, um, but they're not standalone devices. You have to stream something from a television or other device to the Chromecast, and then the Chromecast just displays it on the TV itself. Um, I think I might have said that wrong. You have to stream from a computer to the Chromecast, and then the Chromecast displays on the television. So it's not a standalone thing. So it makes it a little bit more complicated for a lot of users, but it still can be a good option, especially if you're a Google user. Um, you can stream from your Google smartphone, for example. You can stream from a Samsung tablet, um, or you can stream from a laptop or, or something using um, the Chrome browser. And again, the more expensive one is the one that has the 4K video. 
NVIDIA Shield is not one you hear a lot about in, in uh, the streaming world, but it is a very nice device. It's got a very fast processor. It is um, the device of choice for people who are also gamers. So if you have any teenagers or um, people who like to play online video games in the house, NVIDIA Shield is a good one to look at. I'm not super familiar with it myself, so I'm not going to talk a lot about it. Um, but it, is, it does get very good reviews online, particularly for those who are interested in gaming. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, um, if you're just going to watch on your smartphone or on your tablet or even on your computer, you don't even need a, any other device. You can just install the Netflix app on your phone and watch on your phone if you want to do that, and a lot of people do. Um, <clears throat> so in that case, you can skip this extra cost of buying a device. So that's the end of my little section talking about devices. Do you have any questions about those? I don't see anything in the chat, so it's time for another trivia question. So get your pencil ready. In what state was the first bookmobile created? And the answer is Maryland. A librarian there in 1905 created a horse-drawn book wagon to provide mobile library service. So you can just tell me the answer is Maryland when you send me that email. Okay, so often the best streaming content is behind a paywall. You have to subscribe or pay for something in order to stream in a lot of cases, but there are some great free services out there. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of them and a couple that I actually use here at my house. Um, and the first one is kind of old school. When people say they want to stream, one of the big things that limits their desire to do it is that they don't know how they're going to get local channels. And um, you know you can still get an antenna. <laughs> you can still just get a HD antenna or you know one of those big antennas on your roof. Although fewer people do that now, um, and you can just get over-the-air television. It's kind of you know it's that old school. You plug into the antenna port on the back of your TV, and you actually change the channel on the television to change um, the, the channel. And uh, they're not very expensive at all. I think my husband bought the one he has out at his wood shop for about forty dollars. And his mount's on the roof of the building, but you can also get indoor HD antennas that just like hang on the wall right by your television. Here in the Northwoods, the problem, of course, is that we're a long ways from the location of any television broadcast centers. So you're trying to pull a signal out of um, you know places that are far away. You could pretty much get Park Falls, the PBS station over in Park Falls, anywhere in Mercer. Most people say they can get PBS just fine. But if you want any of the networks, those signals are coming from further away. Um, so that makes it a challenge. And we live over in, in Winchester and on a good day my husband can get PBS and maybe CBS and maybe Fox. Um, once in a blue moon we'll be able to just make out channel 12 out of Rhinelander but that's pretty tricky from here. So, um, so it is hard to get that over the air television. Um, but if this is an option for you, one thing to note is that there's also a device called an Air TV. And what that does is it connects to your antenna and then it plugs into your television and you use a little menu to change the channel, the local channel, rather than having to actually change the channel on the television itself. Um, so that's an option, over-the-air television. It still exists, still free, um, other than having an antenna to be able to capture the signal. Uh, again, those local channels are what people really miss when they don't have live television. And um, if all that you're really interested in is local news, most of the news networks, um, most of the local news stations will let you watch their broadcasts on their websites. So that's how we watch the news in the morning. We just go to the, the um, channel's website and play it right on the computer. Our computer happens to be right next to our kitchen, so you can listen to it while you're getting breakfast together. So that's an option and it's free. Um, just like watching it on television, there's going to be advertising in it, um, but that's, you know, that's pretty normal. So you can do this from any device that you can connect to the internet uh, with a web browser in it. So you can do this from your phone, you can do it from your tablet or your computer, and it's a great way just to watch the news. And then there are increasingly a number of free streaming services out there. Um, they usually play programming that has ads, so that's how they pay for themselves. You can't skip the advertisement. It's just like watching 
it's, it's similar to watching over the air TV and that, you know, there'll be ads sprinkled in throughout the programming. Pluto TV is, it is free and it has got an app that you can install on almost any device, including all the streaming devices that I talked about earlier, but also your smartphone and your um, tablet, or you can go to their website if you want to look on your computer. And it's kind of like um, low end cable, you know, like free cable, the weird channels on the cable package. Um, it's got a lot of specialty channels. Like, for example, one day I turned it on and it was playing all like 1970s and 80s Doctor Who shows. Um, or there's one channel that just plays James Bond movies all day long. So it's a weird selection of um, channels, but it is totally free. It's got over 100 channels on it. So there's a lot of things to watch. And um, it's kind of a, you know, interesting addition to the mix. Um, news on is local news broadcasts provided in an app that you can install on your streaming device. Or again, you can install it for your tablet or your smartphone. So um, I can watch uh, Wausau's news broadcast almost any time. They, they provide basically live streaming of the broadcast while it's happening, but then they also provide a recorded version of the most recent broadcasts going back at least a few days, I think. So if you don't have a chance to watch the six o'clock news at six o'clock, you can turn it on at eight o'clock and watch it then. So news on, I think it's great actually. We use it quite a bit here to watch local news. Um, and it might not be completely live, but it is recent broadcast. So it's today's broadcast. It's not delayed very long at all. And then there are other free streaming services, Crackle and Tubi, T-U-B-I, are a couple that have been mentioned to me. I haven't really tried them yet, um, but there are probably going to be more of them popping up and, and disappearing. So um, that's my overview of some of the free options that are out there. Any questions about that? Okay, so let's go on to uh, talking about the big guys in this market, the on-demand services. We'll talk about how you can get live television after this, but right now we're talking about on-demand, which means I want to watch uh, Stranger Things at you know three o'clock in the afternoon. So it doesn't matter what time you want to watch an on-demand service; you can pull it up and play it at any time. Um, so of course, Netflix is the big player in this market. Um, it's not very expensive, starts at about $9 a month for a single device. You pay more if you want more people to be able to watch at the same time um, and for better quality video as well. And then download to two devices with their upper packages. That means that you can, for example, take your tablet if you're going to go on vacation, you can download a bunch of movies and TV shows into your tablet to save them there and watch them without an internet connection. So if you're going to be on the airplane, this is how people watch TV on the airplane. They, they've downloaded it in advance, and then they watch it, the recorded version on their, on their device. You can't do that with Netflix basic package. You have to pay for at least the standard package to be able to do that. And uh, Netflix has a lot of original programming. So House of Cards was their first original show. But as you know, there are more and more movies and TV shows being made just for Netflix, only available on Netflix. They sometimes come out much later on DVD, but um, they, they primarily are Netflix service. So for example, Stranger Things that I mentioned before, there's three seasons of Stranger Things on Netflix. Um, they tend to come out on, video, on DVD at least a year or more after they've been released on Netflix. Um, and so the library has trouble getting them to share with you that way. So, uh, but that's their profit model. They, they invest in this, original programming that's only available on their service um, in order to get you to subscribe, of course. And Netflix is a lot of good movie content. So they, they really have an enormous library. With any of these services, I should back up a little bit and say, most of these services have a free trial period. And I recommend that you try to take advantage of that if you can, because um, it's really hard to know exactly what is on each service unless you've sort of looked at it and, and browse through it. And they change their catalogs a lot based on licensing agreements and all kinds of other factors. So just because you could watch Friends on Netflix last year doesn't mean you can watch it this year. Um, same thing with many other TV shows and movies. Things sort of come and go from these services all the time. The only things you know are going to always be on Netflix are the things that Netflix themselves have made. Um, but at the same time, Netflix has an enormous catalog of movies. 
So Hulu is another competitor to Netflix, and um, they, they lean more towards television content than movies, although there are still a lot of movies available on Hulu as well. Um, but there's a lot of relatively recent television content on Hulu. So if I want to watch uh, a network show like The Good Place, for example, and I can't watch it live on NBC because I don't have a live station, I can watch it on Hulu usually a few days later. Uh, or not, not with every show, but with quite a few of them. So again, it's going to require some research if you're looking for specific shows. Hulu is not very expensive, starts at $6 a month. Um, it's $12 a month with no ads. You will still see a few ads with no ads, um, strangely enough, but for the most part, you're not going to have advertising interrupting your programming with that $12 a month package. Amazon Prime Video is, um, you get Prime Video included with your Prime membership, but the confusing thing is not all Prime content is, not all, not all video content on Amazon is Prime content. Not all of it is included with your Prime membership. Some of it you have to pay extra for. Um, you can purchase or rent new movies uh, as digitally through Amazon Prime. Uh, you can do the same with television shows. You can subscribe to a season of a television show, for example. The prices vary from a couple bucks to 25 bucks or more for a, for a season of a television show. But if that show is the only thing you want and that's the only way to get it, it's probably still cheaper than signing up for a whole service just to get it. So um, again, lots and lots of content on Prime Video, lots of movies, quite a few television shows as well. Um, so they all, and they also have a lot of original content. Amazon is increasing its um, investment in original content. So shows like um, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan, Good Omens, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, all those things are um, Amazon exclusives, so you can't get them anywhere else. Apple TV Plus is a new, new, relatively new player in the market. It's kind of strange right now. Um, if you purchase any Apple device right now, you get a free year subscription to Apple TV Plus. Apple TV is the device. Apple TV Plus is the subscription service. And all it gives you access to is Apple original content. There's no back catalog. There's no old movies here. It's only content that Apple is creating specifically for its own video platform. So I expect it to be at least noticed in this market, if only because everybody who buys an Apple device is getting access to it for free. Um, how long it sticks around, I don't know. We'll see what happens with it. But it's out there. Um, there's not a ton of content in it yet. I do have access to it because my husband bought a laptop about six months ago. So we're, we're about halfway through our, or a few months into our free subscription anyway. Um, and it's, the, the content is good quality stuff, but it's, there's just not a lot of it in there yet. So we'll see where it goes. And Disney Plus is another new player in the market and it's making lots of waves because what Disney did was it pulled most of its content from any other subscriber and has put it only on its own platform. So you used to be able to watch a lot of Disney movies on Netflix. You can't really do that as much anymore. Disney Plus has become really the only place to go if you want to watch a Disney movie, but also all the other things that Disney owns, including National Geographic, Star Wars, Pixar, Marvel. Um, you know, Disney's the media juggernaut. And so they're they're leveraging that into their own streaming platform. It's not very expensive. It's only about $7 a month. You can bundle it, um, or at least you could the last time I looked, with Hulu and ESPN Plus, and the whole package only costs about $13 a month. So it is relatively affordable. Um, and again, tons of content. You know, you, you think you know how many movies Disney has made until you actually look through this thing and you see really how many movies Disney has made. It's a lot. Now, sports is the other thing people are always looking for um, when they want to stream TV. And I will be, I'm sad to tell you that ESPN Plus is not the answer for that. Um, ignoring the fact that right now sports are pretty much shut down, even in good times, ESPN Plus does not give you the same content as ESPN, does not give you most of the live sports that people want to watch. ESPN Plus is kind of a back catalog. Um, you can watch classic content, they call it, which is like reruns of different things. They have documentaries about sports figures. Um, and then there are only selected live events from any of the major leagues. If you're a soccer fan, ESPN Plus might be interesting, um, but you don't even get full access to like SportsCenter. You only get the condensed SportsCenter roundup. 
Um, and you don't get all of NFL prime time, you get a condensed version of that. So I think most people that I have heard of that are subscribing to ESPN Plus are doing it because they've gotten a package, that package that bundles this plus um, Hulu and Disney Plus. And um, I don't know that ESPN Plus is um, that useful to sports watchers, but it does provide some sports content. So if you're not subscribing to a live streaming service, and you can't get regular ESPN, it might be better than nothing. <clears throat> so the next thing I wanna talk about are premium and all access channels. So the way these work is, um, it can be a little bit confusing sometimes. So basically, just like when you used to subscribe to cable and you wanted to add HBO, you pay extra for that. And that's what I mean by premium and all access channels. Even if you have a Hulu subscription, for example, you're still not getting full access to HBO shows or Stars or Cinemax or any of those. You do have to pay extra for them. All access channels are like media companies that want to get you to subscribe to their service in order to get full access to their back catalogs and things. So for example, Hallmark Movies Now, you can watch all the Hallmark movies if you pay like $5 a month. Um, and so if you have a specific interest, you know, BritBox or Acorn are great if you're a fan of British television. Um, CBS Now is popular right now because they're the only ones that have the new Star War, or the, excuse me, the new Star Trek show, Picard. Um, so if you have one of those sort of specialty interests, you might want to be looking into some of these premium channels. How to work is um, some of the major, well, the, the devices that you can get, so the, the Fire TV, the Roku, the Apple TV, you can get an app for these premium channels. Like, for example, you can get the HBO app, but then you still have to subscribe to HBO. You have to pay HBO a subscription fee in order for that app to actually show you any content. Um, Hulu does allow you to um, sort of mesh some of the premium channels right within your regular Hulu thing. So you would be browsing through Hulu's television shows, and if you were also paying extra to Hulu for access to HBO, then you could see the HBO shows in the same place that you're seeing all the other Hulu shows. So that's the sort of two ways to access those things, either as a separate standalone app and paying a subscription, or folding it into another subscription that you have, like Hulu or um, like Sling TV and some of the others that we'll talk about will give you access to that too. So this is kind of like, you know, we always used to say, I wish I could just pick the channels I want and pay my cable company just for those. That's kind of what this is, but be careful what you wish for, because by the time you add in all these little $10 a month things, you're getting to be quite a bit of charge for all of them, uh, especially if you're looking for specific shows that are only on certain platforms. It does make it a bit of a challenge to keep things under control in terms of spending. So that's my um, quick overview of on-demand services. We're about 50 minutes into this program, so we're, we're pretty much on track for where I want to be for time. But I want to stop and ask if there are any questions so far on the on-demand services or devices. Teresa, I, this is Pam. I'd just like to say that um, sometimes, like right now, I'm watching Outlander, and you can subscribe to one of these and you don't have to subscribe for a year. You can subscribe for a month. So that's kind of nice too, if you just wanna like sit here and watch something all day long or whatever, like a lot of us can do right now, you don't have to pay for it any longer than you wanna use the service, which I think is really nice. Yeah, that's a really good point, Pam. Thanks for bringing that up. Because yeah, unlike your cable company or your um, satellite company, there are usually no contracts with these things. You can subscribe for one month and then unsubscribe. You can also use like the seven day trial and just binge watch something and then end your trial before you get charged for it. So that's an option. And CBS Now is actually doing a free one month trial right now. And all of season one of Picard is out. So you could watch all of season one of Picard this month and not pay for it and just cancel your free trial before the end of the month, which a lot of people are doing. So yeah, not having contracts is a really big benefit because you can jump in and out of different services. You want to spend a month on Hulu and watch one show and then cancel that and spend the next month on Netflix, you can totally do that. All right. 
So it's trivia time again. This is the last trivia question of the three that you need to send me um, in order to enter the contest. So what famous librarian shortened his name to eliminate unnecessary letters? This guy was all about efficiency. The answer is Melville Dewey, the creator of the Dewey Decimal System. And he even tried spelling his name D-U-I for a while, but his parents apparently didn't like that. It didn't stick very well. But he did eliminate the extra L-E in his first name and dropped both of his middle names and just went by Melville Dewey. Okay, so the big question that people have when they're going to streaming is, how do I get live TV? And so live TV is um, more technically complicated than on-demand services, and therefore it is more expensive as well. So this is where you're talking about um, things that are really going to actually replace everything that you used to get from cable or satellite. Um, and again, they can be less expensive than subscribing to a satellite service, but they can be almost as expensive, depending on how many things you really feel are important to you and want to pay for. Um, one thing to note if you're looking into st live streaming, particularly for sporting events, is that even in the best live streaming situation, they do tend to be delayed by a minute or two. So don't watch your Twitter feed while you're watching the big game because you might get spoilers. <laughs> so Sling TV is probably one you've heard of because they have a lot of advertising out there. They've been heavily pushing themselves in the, in the regular media market. Uh, relatively inexpensive. They have packages that start at about $30 a month. You do have to sometimes pay extra for certain packages that involve sports or um, kids shows or things like that. And there are a la carte packages too. So um, again, so $30 is a lot less than you were probably paying to your cable or satellite company. So you can still replace some of the networks that you're familiar with. Um, and you're gonna, in order to do this or any of these live services, you're gonna have your streaming device, your Roku or your Am Apple TV or your Amazon Fire TV, and you're gonna install an app on that device for Sling TV. And when you open that app, it's gonna show you all the channels that you can watch and you click on one and, and off you go. Um, Sling TV, along with most of the others, will often offer deals, you know, like incentives to get people to sign up, um, special packages. When I looked at this in February, they were offering $5 for your first month and they were sending you a free HD antenna. So the thing that Sling TV does not do is local networks. So you're not gonna get ABC, CBS, NBC, or Fox um, through Sling TV. You're gonna get the cable channels, ESPN, um, TBS, USA, all those. Um, so Sling TV's answer to that is to give you an HD antenna and that Air TV box that I mentioned before. And those things combined will, will make you able to watch whatever shows you, or whatever over the air television you can get at your house. Um, but so there's no local networks coming directly from Sling TV. Hulu Live is more expensive than Sling TV, but it also has a more comprehensive channel package, including those local networks. Um, so you're gonna be paying 60 something dollars a month, and, um, but you are gonna be able to get those local networks. One thing that's kind of weird about Hulu Live, and I know this because I did it for a while, is that um, it, it asks you to pick a home location you know, like when you're logging in with your device um, for the first time, it'll say, is this your home location? And if you say yes, that's set as your home location and whatever, however Hulu determines where that location is in the world, that's the local channels you're gonna get. Um, and that works great for a lot of people, but when you have CenturyLink, which a lot of us do here in the Northwoods, CenturyLink tends to bounce its IP numbers all over the country. Sometimes we look like we're coming from uh, the Eau Claire area, Sometimes we look like we're coming from Louisiana. And I used to get television from random places because um, based on my IP address, Hulu really couldn't figure out where I was. And there's no way to tell Hulu, please set my home location as Northern Wisconsin. You'd think there would be a way, but there just isn't. I've called their tech support and tried to find out. So you will get live TV, you will get the networks. Um, so if you're watching like network TV shows, you're gonna get those, but you may not get local news through like Hulu Live. It just depends on how your internet company has set things up. It's a quirky thing. And other people have not reported this to me. Um, other people I've talked to said, no, Hulu works just fine for me. So hopefully it would for you too. But for me, it was weird. Um, you wake up in the morning and you'd be hearing news from Louisiana and think, oh, well, I guess my IP address had changed again. 
So Philo is another local or another live TV provider, but again, one that does not provide local TV. These are kind of the basic cable channels, um, but it's cheap. It's only $20, 29, or excuse me, it's only $20 a month, um, but no local channels, no ESPN either. And the only news channel on Philo is BBC. Uh, it does work on most streaming devices though, including your mobile devices. You can get a Philo app for your phone or your tablet. AT&T Now is the Cadillac of live TV streaming packages. It's AT&T owns DirecTV, um, so it, it really is kind of the equivalent of DirecTV, just delivered by the internet instead of through a satellite dish. It's the most expensive live TV option that I'm aware of, but it's also the most comprehensive. So if you're looking for something that truly replaces your cable without any loss of programming or channels, AT&T Now is a place to look, um, but it's expensive. You can also do the add-ons um, for the premium channels like HBO and Cinemax. Some of their packages already include some of those premium channels. And the other thing you can get from AT&T, which you can't get from some other providers, is the league passes. Um, so if you have a particular sport where you want full access, um, you can get that from AT&T. You can get it from a couple of the other ones. So I would check into, um, you know, if you're interested in a particular sport, I would you know, do a little Google search and see what, what streaming services can connect you to that. And AT&T now does include local networks. It also includes regional sports networks. You'll get the Big Ten Network, you'll get the Wisconsin Fox um, Sports Channel, all those things. And the one to watch in the live TV streaming market is YouTube TV. It is, um, YouTube is of course owned by Google, so it's got the power of Google behind it and the dollars of Google behind it. It is relatively new to the market, but I have a feeling it's gonna be a big player pretty soon. Um, and it's sort of that mid-range, $50 a month, which is less than I was paying for satellite, um, but more than I pay now for on-demand streaming. It does include local channels and sports networks and news networks, and it's got um, cloud storage space for recording your shows. So that's what DVR is. A digital video recording. So if you want to record a live show and watch it later, um, because Google owns YouTube, they've got, you know, not quite unlimited, but almost unlimited server space for you to store it on. Um, YouTube TV is not the same as YouTube Premium. That's a different thing. That allows you to watch YouTube videos without advertising. Um, so YouTube TV is a streaming service and um, $50 a month, but I think it's pretty comprehensive and I think it's one to watch in terms of um, shaping the market in, in times to come. So <clears throat> we've talked about a lot of things. It's been about an hour. Um, I'm, I'm ready for final questions, but we're just going to go back to that slide that I showed you at the beginning. How do you make a choice? There's so many options. You know, I showed you 20 different devices and 10 different on-demand services and 10 different live ones. How do you choose? Um, the first and biggest one is obviously your budget. How much do you have to spend each month? And um, what's your budget for buying a device to stream to? So are you gonna get it, need to get a new TV? Are you gonna need to get a streaming device? Are you gonna just use something you already have? Um, those are big considerations. And then your internet speed is a limiting factor in the Northwoods. What internet speed are you even able to get at your house? Um, if you have slow internet now, it's always worth calling your provider to see if they have anything else available. CenturyLink, for example, got a lot of grant funding to expand its fiber optic access to the Northwoods, has not completed getting all that actually connected to customers. So do call and say, I want faster internet. They'll, you know, if, if you and enough of your neighbors call, they may be able to do something. So here's somebody who might have a question. Okay. Um, so, whoops, I didn't mean to go back. <clears throat> I didn't mean to go ahead. And then what content you want is the other big question. You know, what is most important to you and what can you live without? Um, we, when we switched from satellite TV to streaming, my husband was really not happy about not having live TV, but actually the more we've gotten into it, he seems pretty okay with it. He does miss some of the sports though. So, you know, you just have to sit down and think for yourself, what's most important to me? What content would I miss if I didn't have access to it all the time? And, um, and then where can you get it? So if you have a favorite show or a favorite sport, you might have to sit down at your computer and Google it and see, you know, how can I stream NFL football? How can I stream 
you know, NCAA basketball. What options do I have? Um, there's too many of those different ideas and things out there for me to cover them all, but um, Google searching can tell you a lot. I think the biggest thing is to just stop and think realistically. What do I actually watch? What's most important to me to watch? And then try to make your choices accordingly. Um, the question came in, is anyone aware of any advertised devices successful at increasing internet speed? I'm not aware of any. Um, really, the speed is determined by the speed of the line coming to your house more than anything. So if you are on an older um, copper phone line and you're trying to get DSL service, there's limits to how much data that that copper phone line can transmit. Um, same thing with cable. Cable can only transmit so much data across it. So if you're in a neighborhood with a thousand neighbors and they're all trying to transmit their internet over that at the same time, it does slow things down quite a bit. So um, yeah, that's a challenge. Um, if, you're, if you're watching on smaller devices and using standard video instead of HD video, you're gonna get, um, you know, obviously you're gonna be able to stream a little bit better because it's not gonna use as much data. Okay, so my slide says, don't forget, you can always check out DVDs at the library. Of course, you can't do that right now, unfortunately, but when we reopen, you can always get DVDs at the library. And we do try to keep up with some of the more popular TV shows as well as brand new movies. So you don't always have to get these things through streaming or your satellite provider. You can come to the library and check things out. <clears throat> So that's everything I had today, and we kept it to just about an hour, um, which is fun. Don't forget to email me the answers to the three trivia questions that were in this presentation, and uh, email me that by Sunday night. I will be doing the drawing first thing on Monday morning. So I'm going to post this recorded um, class on our website so people can watch it if they weren't able to sit here with me. And um, <clears throat> oh, another comment just came in. Um, GoGibicRange.net has some faster service in Mercer. Yes, yeah, so if you haven't looked at GoGibic Range, um, they are installing new internet towers around Mercer and other areas in the GoGibic and Iron County range. And um, they might be able to provide you faster service than CenturyLink did. So GoGibicRange.net is their website. Any other questions? I don't have a question, Teresa, but thanks so much. You're always so informative. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Pam. I'm glad you found it useful. Okay, well, if you do think of any questions, my email address and phone number are on the screen. You can get the slides for this handout at our website, um, mercerpubliclibrary.org slash program and class handouts with hyphens in between, or just click on our website and look under the other resources menu and program and class handouts are listed there. So you'll find the slides. Um, it's the slides from February, so it doesn't have the trivia answers. So if you didn't write them down, you're gonna have to watch again, sorry, haha. -ha. But um, thanks for attending today, guys. I hope you're all staying well during this uh, self-isolation time, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to see you at the library again soon. Thanks, Teresa. You're welcome. Okay, bye-bye, everybody.